what's going on, everybody? How's it hanging? How's it happening? Because you guys know what it is. This is Kevin from the Code Progression Podcast, brought to you by MSO TD Rocks, where rock and metal thrive. Hey, guys, we're at the end of October already, but my God, this episode <laughs> is different because, you know, I always interview bands on this. There's been one instance in the past year and a half where I have not interviewed a band, and that was because I did a whole entire episode by myself on Blue Ridge Rock Fest, but this one's a little bit different as well because... This is not someone in a band, but they are in the music industry. They have a vinyl pressing business, and they're the one that help, you know, make sure these artists can press these vinyls really creative way. It's an incredible podcast you to listen to, all about vinyl, the different side of the music business, economics, all this stuff that's talked But Before we get started, I want to thank our sponsor, Phoenix Fitness. You know me, back in mosh pits, going crazy all the time. I'm not stepping out of them. But I got to make sure that I'm fit enough to make to you know be able to do this so I don't pass out or tap out halfway through. I'm in the gym, cardio, lifting all the time, make sure that I'm strong enough, you know, have the cardio energy and make sure that this happens. But I got to prepare and recover right. That's where Phoenix Fitness comes in to help me achieve those goals with different pre-workouts, both stim and stim-free, BCAA recovery compounds, creatines, proteins, multivitamins, anything you need to help achieve your fitness goals. Phoenix Fitness has that for you. Our listeners and viewers on YouTube get 15% off using the code MSOTD at checkout at fnxfit.com. Link description below. Thank you, Phoenix Fitness. So, This episode comes to you via Crestfallen Records. Yes, they create and print vinyls, many different variants for bands. I get to talk to Bryce, one of the guys that runs Crestfallen. We talk about vinyl collections. We talk about the process of printing, how they get connected to the bands, why they do what they do, and of course, the economics behind it all. This is really different for us in a little ways, but you know what? Still feels natural. Are you guys ready for this really insanely insightful podcast let's go yeah well 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 ladies and gentlemen boys and girls listeners of the court progression podcast you guys know i love to interview bands especially those that are emerging coming up in the scene and be the biggest by the end of the decade and those that are already like at that level this one is a little bit different this is one that comes to me from uh good old blue ridge rock fest on my way out of the festival throughout the whole entire festival I was moshed with this guy, Joe. The reason I remember him was he was wearing a Packer hat the whole entire time. I'm wearing a Vikings hat, so you think we're bitter rivals. We were in like every other pit, like every three, four pits together, and it was just fun as all hell. On the way out of the festival, on the last day, he brings up his buddy who does some incredible stuff with music, especially with vinyl prints, and I'm like, well, man, let's make it happen. And all of a sudden, here it is. So please welcome Bryce from Crestfallen Records. So Bryce, welcome to Core Progression Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks for being on, man. How's everything going? And uh, you're from Pennsylvania, right? Yeah, Pittsburgh specifically. Well, how's everything going in Pittsburgh right now? Yeah, it, it's going. Uh, the Rolling Stones are playing tonight. So everything's kind of just a mess downtown. But aside from that, it's fine. Please tell me that didn't take you away from seeing the Rolling Stones. Oh, I... No, not at all. <laughs> Otherwise, I was going to feel really, 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 really bad about myself. <laughs> but no, you know... I, I'm not really that much into them so it doesn't impact me too much understandable it's like one of those it's like anything with especially you know those bands those real i would say the legacy bands of the legacy bands that are around right now it's those touring artists that are just have been around for you know 40 50 plus years to where we respect them we respect what we what they do and would it be cool to see them yeah i'm not gonna lie it'd be cool to see them play live but it's something where if you're going to give me an opportunity to see the Rolling Stones play live or all of a sudden it's like, hey, you want to go see Slipknot in the same day? I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, Slipknot, let's go. Right. Just, you know, different strokes for different folks. So, Bryce, usually when I have bands on the podcast, I like to start out a certain way just to kind of have some fun, just kind of get everybody, you know, loosened up a little bit, just have, you know, get some laughs going on there. And I always ask three separate questions. So I'm going to ask the same three to you. The first two very easy, very simple. If you don't get them right, th- th- there might be a problem here. But the third one puts you on the spot just a little bit. And I'll give you some examples of some of the answers I've heard just to kind of give you a little time to think about it, but also so that you can laugh at some of the craziest things I've heard. So I want to know, first off, what is your name? Second thing, with Crestfallen Records, what do you do? And you can give a summarized version of this one because we can go a lot deeper into it. But the third thing is, I want to know a little fun, facky, uh, fun, wacky, interesting fact or story about yourself that will hopefully make me laugh my ass off, fall face first on my table. 
fall off, give myself a concussion, and just have a good time. So, not gonna lie, here are some of the weird ones I've heard. Bands have chloroformed their lead singers, dragged them to a beach in Florida, buried them halfway in the sand, and put a whole bunch of ketchup around it to make it look like their legs got bitten off by a shark. There's another one where a band, you know, they're driving to a show in a van. They gotta get there on time, so they can't really stop, and the guitarist in the front seat, man, he's gotta go. Gets a big bottle like those, like, big gulps from uh, 7-Up, goes and pees in it. All right, throws it out the window. Yeah, but when you're going 60, 70 miles an hour and the back window's open, that thing's going to come into the back window and give the drummer a golden shower. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's a drive-by golden shower story. So I always like to bring up those two. Those are the two that always, I, I just cannot forget for the life of me. And it gives you a little more time to think about it. So, Bryce, I'll let you take it away. All right. Uh, my name is Bryce Holman. I pretty much run and own Crestfallen Records. Uh, I do it with a partner of mine, and we pretty much just hook up with bands and print their albums on vinyl and sell them for them. Uh, story wise, like I don't even know where to <laughs> go with that because like I can't top any of those, right? Um, I guess. I mean. Yeah, I honestly genuinely have no idea. <laughs> like, I'll be honest, I live a very, I don't want to say boring life, but it's pretty, like, just laid back and chill. I mean, I guess, can it be a story about someone else, maybe? Yeah, I've heard those. I'll, I'll even preface it with this. There was one time I had a band called, uh, God, what was it, with, uh, called Sleep Waker on, and their bassist was telling me a story about in a band that he used to be in, about how one of the members basically uh, ate some bad, like I forgot, I forgot if it was like KFC or Long John Silver's or something, and literally had to crap in the middle of a interstate median. Only for a couple episodes later to have that exact same band on that he used to be in and heard that story from the guy that it happened to. So I have heard stories about, you know, other people. Okay. But as long as long as long as you're involved in the story somehow, I'm yeah. all good with it. Okay, so I went to college for entertainment management and stuff like that. So, you know, we normally have like professors that were in the industry in some way, shape or form. And one of the guys used to be a concert promoter and still like did it part time and everything. And he would tell us like stories of like, oh, you know, I got to like hang out with this artist backstage. I did this or whatever. And he told us one time, he's like, oh, I was called in one day and was told that he had to pick Jay Leno up from the airport and then take him back at the end of the day. So, okay. you know, goes and does that. And on the way out to the airport after the show, Jay Leno was like, Hey, I, I want to go get a piece of pizza. So they go into this, you know, random little pizza shop. That's like in the middle of nowhere. And like, you know, they walk in, get the pizza and Jay Leno's like, no, I I'm paying for it buys like this massive pizza that they're eating in the car no one recognized him and these are the stories my professor didn't want to tell us like he would tell us like oh i you know did this show and that was it like he would tell us like the practical stories but the really fun ones were he almost decapitated an artist technically almost <laughs> they were testing the rigging and you know no one was in it and one of the straps broke and everything crashed down. Thankfully, no one was there and it was the test, but it was one of those things that's like, okay, I know we're in college, we have to learn, but can you tell more of like those kinds of stories that we actually know like, hey, the weird things can and will probably happen. Honestly, it's when you're dealing it with college and it's like you have those professors that I mean, you, you don't want necessarily the ones that are just going to be so straightforward and to the point the whole entire time because you're not going to want to go to class. It's boring as all hell. It's like being in high school where you're forced to have to be there and you're just hearing someone with like monotone like Bueller, 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 just go on and on and on. It's boring as all hell. But you don't want the professor going to go off on all those tangents just because all of a sudden you're not going to necessarily learn anything. And by the time you end up getting your midterms or your finals, you're like, when the hell did we talk about any of this stuff? You got to right. find that perfect balance of, being able to talk about what you know, what you need to be taught. However, throwing some of those fun, wacky stories in there to make sure you know people want to come to class and people start paying attention a little bit more. Yeah, exactly. It's all about it, but dang, 
I gotta go find a way to pick up Jay Leno at the airport so I can uh, get some pizza with him. <laughs> Dude, but the thing is, like, no one in that shop recognized him. I guess they were all thinking, like, okay, it might be Jay Leno, but, like, why would he be here? So we're not gonna, you know, make an idiot out of ourselves and ask if that is Jay Leno? But, yeah. Or it could be somewhere they just genu- genuinely just like said, you know what? If they knew it was Jalen, it's like, eh, he's just a guy, you know, yeah, just one of us. Bad. So just treat him like we would anybody else. We got a job to do. He just wants his pizza. Let's just make it happen. Exactly. So you went to school for, what was it? En- you said entertainment management? Yeah. So was that something that really got you into creating Cresson Records and doing all the vinyl printing? Or how did this all kind of come into fruition from where you wanted to start going like once you got out of high school going into college to where you are now like how did that whole entire story transpire to get to crestfallen records okay so in high school like i was always into music uh i drummed so i wanted to be in a band like that was that was the end goal but ultimately you know i said i was like okay i need to be realistic here for a bit went to college found out that you know they had a major specifically for like the record industry and stuff like that I was like, okay, that's the fit. Went there, learned about it, and graduated not really knowing what to do. And I'm thinking, you know, I collect vinyl. I collected CDs. I was like, maybe I'll open a record store. But during our one final project, I realized that that's not practical, really. (laughs) At least, you know, to have like a physical store. So I kind of just went from there. I'm like, okay, I know I want to sell cds or sell vinyl or like sell some type of media and i figured the best way to do it was to just do vinyl and a lot of other friends of mine were creating labels around the same time and i figured well if they're doing it i can certainly do it especially since they didn't go to college for it i did that kind of puts me on equal footing a little bit and it it kind of just went from there in all honesty Interesting. Well, one thing that you did bring up that I think a lot of people could take from that story, because there's something that I kind of uh, related to in there was where, you know, you went to college and you had an idea of what potentially you wanted to do. And even with like kind of had that more like, OK, let's get realistic at this point. Not gonna lie, sometimes just trying to, you know, get realistic. It ends up taking you away from what necessarily you really want to do with life, because even when it comes to, you know, that thought of just being realistic, it's like, okay, you know, get a job in like some corporation, get the health and benefits and whatnot. If you want to do that, by all means, go for it. But there's a lot of people out there like Bryce, like my myself, where it's like, yeah, that's not really for us. So yeah. you went after something that you figured out, you know, while you're going through that, you're figuring out exactly kind of, okay, what's making you happy? Collecting a lot of CDs, collecting a lot of vinyl. Okay. How can you work within that? And it totally makes sense that you, you know, thought about opening a record store, but Let's be honest, in today's day and age, record stores. It, it's online. That That's what you would have to do. Absolutely. Because I think every single vinyl I've ever gotten has been an online purchase. I've never bought, no, scratch it. I bought the first one, like physically at a brick and mortar store. The first one. I'll tell you that, yeah, every like, other one online. I feel like everyone's first one is probably at an actual store. But like once you really get into the hobby, you're not maybe the record store day ones but even then like for me i just wait like i think it's what like 5 p.m maybe that they're allowed to put them online and then that's when i grab mine i'm not camping outside of a store or anything at like three in the morning for it no i mean and and if you are going to camp outside at three in the morning for it's got to be from a band that you genuinely have the super strong connection to and it's going to be a vinyl that's going to be like the coolest thing you ever saw similar like when i saw the i think it was Supposed to be for Record Store Day 2020, but of course that never really went happening because of uh, damn COVID. But the one I kind of wanted to get at that point was uh, the special edition of Ice Nine Kills the Silver Screen because it looked like a hacksaw blade. And I was like, yeah. oh, that's cool. But then I'm like, nah, I still I actually I got the whole thing with the blood splattered one. I'm good. Yeah, I mean, I ended up grabbing that one online, I think maybe like. Two or three days later off of Discogs for like $15, I think. Oh, you lucky bastard. <laughs> There's a million copies up there. I know. I just say I it, when it comes to when it comes to me with vinyl, I think you and I are on a little bit of a different wavelength where it's like you collect them and there's certain things that you really like to collect. Like you're so much more into it than I for me, it's like I get I get a copy, I enjoy it, 
I still play them. I don't care, like, if they're the special edition ones. It's just not my thing. I'm like to put them on the wall and be like, okay, you know, except for the one disturbed one I have up there because, well, yeah, that one kind of got signed. So I wanted to make sure That's that fair. one was a little more protected. But the other ones, it's like I've got 50 others that are sitting down there right now. Usually throw them on this bad boy because, well, why not? It's fun. Quality is fantastic. So I'm like, you know what? Doesn't hurt to also put put some vinyl on and then actually listen to the album from front to back the way it's intended. Exactly. So I got to ask, well, because you collect vinyl, what was the thing that really got you into vinyl in the first place? So my girlfriend always brings this story up because I think I bought my first one, maybe like senior year of high school. And I always said I would never buy vinyl. Like I would just never get into it. It wasn't something I cared about. I didn't think it was corny, but I was just like, I, I don't get it. But walked into a Hot Topic, you know, when they still sold vinyl. <laughs> yep. And at the time I was, I think I was working on my Silverstein CD collection. And I'm Alive and Everything I Touched was the last CD I didn't have. And they had a sale. It was like $9 for a vinyl. And it came with the CD. So I bought it thinking, I'll be happy with that. I have the CD. I don't care about the vinyl. And then it kind of just went from there. Like every time a record store around me had a sale or like a clearance discount or whatever, I would just pick one up and then it just snowballed into probably an unhealthy obsession, I would say. But (laughs) I mean, I don't know. I mean, that's kind of understandable. And I relate to that as well, because that's how I started with it was literally walked into a hot topic on Black Friday might have been 2013. Just because, you know, I was out with a couple of friends who wanted to see what was going on there. They had vinyl and the only they only had one copy of The Suffer and the Witness by Rise Against. And that's my favorite album of all time. Like, you know what? I think this would be cool just to have and, you know, like put up in my dorm, put up in my apartment when I'm in college, just call it a day and have it at that. All of a sudden I'm like, but now I want the whole Rise Against discography. So let's make that happen. And then it was like, okay, you know, I was really listening to a lot of 30 Seconds of Mars. I'm like, I want their whole discography. And I'm like, okay, now let's start getting some of these other ones. So it's like, okay, here's some, let's get a bunch of like uh, Breaking Benjamin. Let's get some more Disturbed ones. Let's get some, a couple of the Ice Nine Kills if I can, a couple of the Motionless and White ones, and just keep going. And now it's just like, I look at them thinking, I'm like, yeah, I kind of uh, like concerts, getting the vinyl, starting to get really addicted to those, but Every single Christmas for the past three, four years that I've asked for like four or five vinyls. They're like, I don't care. Good Christmas gifts, man. Not going to lie. See, at least you can ask for them for Christmas because for me, like I'll say, like, you know, tell my family or tell my girlfriend or whatever. And they're all like, we'd buy them. But by the time we get them, you will have already bought them. <laughs> so they're just like, at this point, it's like, here's like $300 for whatever off of like Discogs or whatever have fun and it's like honestly for me that's probably the best way to do it (laughs) because they're right i'm just extremely impatient when it comes to that just because like you know it goes up it's going to sell out eventually and i don't want to risk it oh i understand that especially when it when it's something that you know if you get one of those specialist ones those collectors ones that you really want especially with how much you're into this and how much you're collecting i mean you start a whole entire record label based off of creating vinyls and pressing them and creating them for these artists of course you're going to be the one that's going to want to you know get them as soon as possible to make sure that you get them and if you're going to ask them for a birthday for christmas or whatever and your like your family your girlfriend are going to go on and try and buy something even if they get it, it's like you probably have already have it like ordered it in the mail and on on the way so they'll order it and then all of a sudden later that day boom here comes some here comes fedex or ups it to your house and all of a sudden now you have it. it's like they're thinking wow that was fast no 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 Bryce already bought it. Yeah, I I ordered it like a week ago. (laughs) But But again, it's all based upon just with you, with how you are into the collecting vinyl and how you go about it and how you enjoy it. Uh, It makes a lot of sense. I'm not going to lie. And that can be for anybody that's into any sort of thing when it comes to collecting whatever. I mean, look at what happened when all of a sudden, like, you know, Pokemon cards became a huge thing collecting. And when sports cards became a huge thing, now what's happening with NFTs, it's a lot of that similar style. We've seen a lot of people get into it, but when it comes to vinyl, it's, you know, you've got to enjoy the music to also want to do something like this. Yeah. Um, I mean, you do get those people that are like, oh, it's a cool color. I'm going to buy it. And I, I try to not do that. But I mean, for any hobby, like you have to enjoy what you're buying. 
otherwise I, I don't see why you're there unless you're trying to make money, but that's a long-term thing and not a short-term thing. Well, even if you're trying to make money and you don't enjoy it, you're going to end up feeling like it's more of a laborious task than instead, instead of something that you really enjoy. Because I'll use myself as an example. Say I was trying to sell like sports cards or Pokemon cards or sneakers or something like that. Use sneakers as a perfect example because me, I don't give a crap. That's not my thing. But if I try to get into it because I knew the, the money was there, I might enjoy it for like a week because of the possibility of, ooh, money, but to put all the time and effort into doing that, hell no. I'd have to really enjoy it. Similar with you and Vinyl where getting this collection and really growing this to the point where, you know, you want to start your own label to help print these vinyls for these bands, you're going to have to enjoy the music. You're going to have to enjoy what is actually a part of that at, to some extent. Yeah, I, I would totally agree. So now I got to ask when it comes to your collection, because you said that you started out the whole entire thing with just trying to find that one CD for Silverstein. What bands are the typical kind of bands when it comes to your collection that you really go and collect? Don't worry, folks that are listening about this. We are going to get into the whole entire record label side, but I kind of want to get a little bit more into Bryce about this because I'm curious to see what his collection all entails because I know some of you out there are going to want to know. Okay, so he here's my collection, right? Is I have such a hard time just picking one. So like say a band puts up pre-orders and there's like seven different variants for it, right? I'm buying all seven. I don't care at that point. Like typically I'll do it if it's a band like I really love. Now, if it's a band that's, you know, just okay, I'll get maybe two. Like I'll get like the best ones and just call it a day at that. So a lot of my collection is just full variant collections at this point with like, you know, a few things like sprinkled in. Um, I have a very horrible crippling addiction to a day to remembers stuff. <laughs> um, that was like the biggest variant collection I did, which is like 115 variants at this point, I think, which is just absurdly ridiculous whenever I tell people. 115? What the hell? It's about that. It's somewhere like 110, 120, I think. Yikes. And I, I mean, that I assume that spans every single one of their full length uh, LPs at this point. Yeah. So it's old record through the new one and then Attack of the Killer B-Sides and the All I Want uh, EP 7-inch kind of thing they did. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was like, if you didn't have Attack of the Killer B-Sides, I was like, that. I feel like that would be something like, especially for you with all the variants you have, that has to be something that you would collect. Yeah, that's honestly, it's one of my coolest variant collections because they really did like the most random colors for that. But there's like 20 some variants just for that one, maybe 10. I don't It It's way too much for just one EP. Oh, understandable. A very similar what's happening with like uh, with Ice Nine Kills with the release of the Silver Scream 2. It's like every single week, every single Nightmare of the Night, there's another colored variant oh, yeah. that comes out. I'm like, mm -hmm. well, initially when you guys released them, you had six versions. And all of a sudden, I'm like, here's seven, here's eight, here's nine. And all of a sudden, this past week, it's like, here's ten. When, but when uh, October 9th comes out, because we're shooting this before the release of the album, when October 9th comes out, there's probably going to be like two more. All of a sudden, there's oh, going to be like sure. a special like, oh, release day. Here you go. Here's another variant. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to be like... I bought the blood splattered one and that's the only one I'm going for. <laughs> okay. So here's the story with me and Ice Nine Kills is back like two or three years ago, I got, they used to be like my favorite band in the world. Okay. And I got the greatest idea to go out and buy a hundred percent of their merch. So I go all the way back to 2005, find all the shirts, everything. Oh. And I think I got like, maybe 75 80 percent done but there was some stuff that was just so ridiculously hard to find that you know i wasn't going to like try forever and it got to the point where i bought um one of their demos off of shane from silverstein after he showed it <laughs> off once and i ended up selling off like 90 percent of my ice nine kills collection just because like after every nightmare on the ninth, it was getting bigger and bigger and I couldn't keep up with it. I'm like, you know what? It they're a cool band. I can't do this anymore. But so I have a variant collection for Ice Nine Kills, and this album has been killing me. Because I oh, think wow. it, they're on 13, I think, including the new Every Trick in the Book and Predator Becomes the Prey Presses. They repress every trick in the book. Okay, I gotta go find that one because I I gotta try. I actually gotta find both of those right now. I gotta add those to the collection because, well, now I'm intrigued. I gotta find those. 
I know Predator is on Amazon, and I think there might be a black for, variant of Every Trick in the Book on Amazon as well because it's not labeled. But they had like a clear with smoke on Revolver when I think pre-orders for Silver Scream 2 came out. But I think that one sold out already. I could be wrong. There might be a copy or two left. I'll see what I can go and try and find. But I totally understand where you're coming with where, you know, it's like you pump the bricks on the Ice Nine Kills collection because even for me, it was like every Nightmare on the Ninth. I'm like, okay, let's see what happens here. And I wanted every little bit of it, but I'm like, this is going to be a little too much money for even me. So it was like I'd buy maybe one shirt or one thing. And then it's like, okay, now with the new album, it's they came out with stuff in July for all the hip to be scared stuff. I'm like, okay, let's see. I'm like, oh, I could use a new poster for the back. So let's get one of those. Still hasn't come in yet. I bought a t-shirt for one of my friends when we were going to go see Ice Nine Kills because she didn't have anything. Still hasn't come in yet. And that show has passed. And then uh, it, it takes a while. Oh, I know but... it takes a while, but I thought it wasn't going to take two months. Usually for them, it takes a month for all their stuff. And then from what I've had, even during the pandemic as well, because that's when I really started doing all the Nightmare in the Nine stuff because I couldn't help it. It was like every shirt I saw, I'm like, this is really kind of cool. <laughs> so I'd see, wear it to I... work and shit. And this is hilarious. Yeah, see, I, I had to stop because it was to the point where I'm like, I saw a shirt. I'm like, oh, that's OK. Yeah, I'll get it. But at this point, it's like if I'm not like in love with the design right from right off the start, I I just have to talk myself out of it at this point. Yeah, I was like with me when they did the assault and batteries when I was like, there's stuff I think is cool in here. But now nah, let's pull off. All of a sudden they did the rainy day stuff. I'm like, OK, some of these are a lot cooler than I like than I thought. Ooh, there's a black long sleeve. Ding. Yep. <laughs> And I still wait for those to come. Okay, it'll be, I know it'll be some time, but, you know, it happens. But this is what happens when all of a sudden it's like you find bands that you really like. And all of a sudden, you know, they come out with all this different cool shit. And it's like, okay, you want to end up having, you want to support them as much as possible. You want to grow that collection. But it does get a little bit pricey at times. So sometimes you got to pump the brakes and really figure out if you want. Like with you, with with collecting all these different vinyls and all these different vinyl variants, that's something that's really near and dear to your heart. That's something that's really a passion for you and a really, you know, a huge hobby for you as well. Along with, you know, especially with Crestfallen Records, not just a hobby. This is a lifestyle. This is a career right here. Trying to make it a career. We'll, we'll see where it goes. Even if I have to get like some boring nine to five job, I'm probably still going to be doing this on the side, at least to make myself happy. Hey, man, I will tell you this right now. So this isn't I like I have to have like a, one of those like nine to five full time jobs to continue to support myself until, you know, this whole entire podcast thing gets to that point where I can su- sustain myself. But I think about it to the point where I would much rather have that nine to five and keep doing this than to just have that nine to five and not do this at all. It's like if I'm if, if that's going to help make sure that I can do this and this is what makes me happy. All by all means, I'm going to make sure that happens. So if you're kind of have that same mindset, especially with Crestfallen. If that comes to that, you know, go for it just because of the fact that don't let your dream die due to the fact that, you know, you might have to get practical at some point. Oh, for sure. You just got to make it work within there. That's all you got to do. Yeah. All right. So now I got to ask when it comes to Crestfallen, because this is really something I get interested in where I was looking on the website. I know you had some bands that you had with vinyls that you guys were printing on. My question to you now is this. When it comes to getting bands to be with Crestfallen, for you guys to do those pressing of the vinyls and really create them for those bands, how do you go about that? Uh, so pretty much we start off where I'll hit up the guy that I run it with, uh, Nathan, and I'll just tell him like, hey, I want to try to go after this band. We brainstorm some variant ideas. He'll send some my way. I'll send some his way. We pick out the best ones create some mock-ups that end up going on the site. And we normally message the band say, hey, this is what we want to do. This is how we're going to do it. This is kind of like our agreement on it. And you pray that they give you a response back. (laughs) Uh, That's the key part is just waiting sometimes months to hear back. And, you know, after that, it's pretty much you place the order with the pressing plant, put them up for sale, and then that's a run essentially kind of similar to the podcast stuff as well where it's like for some bands it's like i just got to go out and figure out how to get in touch with them and then just take it from there but it's a little bit different on your end because it's something where with on my end it's a lot less of a time and money commitment with yours because you know this is you're pressing out there's a lot more money being exchanged at this point 
there's going to be more of that wait time and more of that going through everything to make sure that those bands want to go through with this. But the fact that you guys are presenting so many different these variant ideas to them and if you're able to present a business plan out to them so that when they look at this, it's, you know, kind of like that Godfather moment, like, make him an offer he can't refuse. Then, you know, you're going to end up getting somewhere. And I, the fact of the matter is, is, you're, is that you're not brand new to this. You've been doing this for a little bit of time. So even when you take a look at the Crestlawn Records website, like there are vinyl variants up there for you guys to go check out and pick up if you want, which I suggest you do. Yeah, I mean, by all means, if specifically like until we die i think is probably our best release i think in terms of like musicianship but they're all they're all solid releases so when it comes to creating these variants how do you get the inspiration to come up with these variants you get to listen to the music beforehand you get to take a look at the album artwork before which i assume you would to really try and create an idea of a variant so that you can really create this whole entire variant that really connects with the music overall or how do you go about this so so far at least we haven't done any new albums so everything we've done is has been out for you know a few years um i think our earliest release might be 2014 and i think our most recent was like 2015 2016. like we're trying to focus around like the mid 2010s and then onward like we're not opposed to doing new bands but for me it's getting the stuff pressed that myself and like a lot of other people that collect Vana have just been asking for, but bands just might not have the means to do it or even know how to do it. So um, pretty much we always try to match them with the artwork on the cover. I know some people like that. Some people don't. I personally do. I always liked when the vinyl matched the color. So, or the cover. So that's what, you know, that's how we do it is pretty much just go on Google search up, like, I don't know, like a red with black splatter vinyl and then pull it, make the mock up and just go from there. See, that's something I wasn't necessarily expecting, but now I'm a little more interested in that to the point where instead of really focusing on newer bands and newer releases, you're focusing on releases that weren't pressed into vinyl upon initial release so that the band can somewhat do a re-release for them and fans that are really getting into more of the vinyl collection side of things, or even if they're not in the vinyl collection side of things, they just really like the band and want to have that nice physical copy of it, especially the fact that like over the past 10 years, vinyl has become a medium once again for people to collect music because it's somewhere it, ha it it's somewhere you have the music physically, like you feel like you actually have it, but it's something that has a little bit more value to it and has somewhat increasing value to it in comparison to current CDs and cassette sales. Yeah. Um, I know like a lot of the releases that we do um, because I grew up listening to like gen, like the progressive metalcore kind of side of stuff, like when that was all bubbling and a lot of that stuff was either digitally or they did CDs at shows like that. That was it for bands like that. So to go back and be able to work with some of these bands that, you know, I looked up to when I was in high school, and being able to give like this massive like vinyl treatment to those albums is like the greatest thing to me because I've always wanted to see them pressed. So if anything, I'll say like pressed vinyl is like a selfish kind of thing for me <laughs> because no one else is going to press these albums. The bands won't. Some of them are broken up. They don't care anymore. So I'm just going to have to do it because like no one else will. But if you're going to be the one that has to do it, I understand where you're coming from by saying it is a selfish thing, but Honestly, that's kind of the way it has to be, though, especially with some of those bands that are on the more genty side that might not be together anymore, because who else is going to go and press these things, especially with when they were when those bands were at their heyday? A lot of people might have been really into them. And all of a sudden, now they see the fact that they can get one of their favorite albums from a band they really love, you know, back in the mid 2010s. That's no longer around. They can get that album in vinyl. Hell, even if they have a vinyl player or not, it's something that would be cool to have as a variant and put up on a wall and frame and all of a sudden it's like, hey, look at that shit. You know, how cool is that? Especially like, getting the album art that, you know, might have only been on like a little CD. That's what, like four and a half inches, I think, square maybe. You know, blown up to a 12 by 12 jacket. You know, you get to see that artwork. You get to see the detail on it. And I don't know, it's just, there's something different about it to me. I think another thing, I mean, even for myself, I think the biggest thing is, and I think a lot of other people that collect vinyl also feel this way, is 
when we have when we listen to music, it's some it feels a little bit different to actually hold it in your hand. Yeah. To really feel more connected to it that way to the point where you put it on and you let that thing spin and you feel more connected to it because it's you've bought this and it had more it has more value to it. It's just, you know, monetary wise in comparison to CDs, cassettes, physical or uh, or digital downloads or streaming. I just got to throw it in there because, of course, that's the biggest way people are consuming music these days, even though I'm not the uh, biggest proponent of it for the sole fact is it doesn't have you as invested in the music. So if you end up buying a vinyl album, it's you have invested in that. Even if it's a band that you like or if it's a if it's a band that you like and it's an album that you already know of or if it's a band that's releasing a new album that you want to check out, but you're not necessarily sure how it's going to sound because, hey, you've maybe only heard one or two singles of it before it's released. So you're going to pre-order it and you're going to hope for the best. It's You're going to have more of an investment in that one, especially when you feel it in your hands and then you play that thing. You're going to run through that thing a couple of times. You're going to play it on the front and on the back and just keep pulling through it. And even if it's something that you might not necessarily hit right away, you're going to end up being more invested in it and you're going to end up, you know, potentially pulling something even greater out of it because you're putting that time and effort into really listening to the music and really enjoying it and understanding it. So there is this feeling of, you know, ownership a little bit to that copy of the music well i also just find it interesting like when you look at a cassette right it's the files are on a you know the tape that's it cd same thing like it's just stored on there but for a vinyl the music is physically cut into that disc like i don't know to me it's just the biggest difference between the two because you actually physically hold like you know, the wavelengths of the music technically. That is another good way to put it. It, it. It's again, it's more of that closer connection to the actual music to the point where, I mean, when you're listening to music, of course, the sense that you're going to end up using is your sense of hearing because yeah, that's what you're going to be listening to. But especially the vinyl, what you're saying is when you actually physically hold your hands because now it's cut into there, you have that sense of touch that adds into it. I mean, it's the weird thing of like being able to physically hold audio because like, you know, realistically, you can't touch music. But when it's vinyl, I feel like that's the closest thing that you can get to ever being able to touch music. Oh, unless, you know, science somehow does something weird where you can get closer to it. But for right now, like I would say that's as close as you can get to it. I don't know. They might call that thing acid, but that's just me. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> if, if we're going into that, then yeah, sure. <laughs> I couldn't help it. I'm like, okay, this is too perfect to say this right now. But I do understand what you're saying where it's right now is the closest thing we get to actually using another sense outside of our ear, like our hearing to actually feel the music. And of course, you know, you can see it, especially more when, you know, you might see the wavelength, especially like when you're looking at it, uh, like the wave version on a computer, or if you're watching the music video, because then you're adding more of this visual interpretation to it. But then again, what happens? It's like, you're always going to hear it, but what happens when you can feel it, when you can actually hold it in your hands, there is more of a weight to it. I mean, hell, when we, like when we bought our first vinyls, I mean, you bought it because of a CD. Me, I bought it as my favorite album of all time. It was a different feeling actually having that physical copy around. Oh, for sure. Like whenever I held it, I was like, okay, I wouldn't hate getting a second one. And then, you know, it was, I wouldn't hate getting a third or a fourth and then, you know, so on. Or a 10th or a 20th or a 30th, especially when it comes or to data. 600th. Remember? <laughs> or, or a thousandth. Are you, are you at a thousand right now with your collection? No, I'm sitting close to 600, like somewhere between 575 and 600, I think. Maybe okay. 650. I don't know. It, it depends with if you count pre-orders or not. Um, I would count pre-orders right now just because it's something where you've already paid for them. They are on the way. The whole purpose is that like the, the album just hasn't physically released. It hasn't uh, had the release date yet, but you have those vinyls coming your way. Okay, then yeah, I probably passed 600 at this point. <laughs> I would assume so, especially with all the Ice Nine variants that they're having. And there's probably going to be more too in the next like oh, for sure. coming days that are before the album release and even after the album release as well. It's like, oh yeah, there's going to be some special like release on Halloween or release on when they do the whole entire uh, Thanks Killing show. Like there'll be something yeah, around there. There's, there's always something else with them, and you know, they're a band that I don't get tired, you know, of buying, but. 
that's the thing like for a day to remember being at like what like 115 they're one of the very few bands that i will tell people it's like yeah i wish they made more it's like i'm so far in at this point yeah that's like you know they'll put up like two more it's like okay what what's two compared to 110 yeah and it's it's nothing to me at this point but you know they don't do it i mean they're only going to be able, they're only going to do so much though so it's going to get to yeah, a point there where and like using Iceland Kills example, it's especially with all the horror tie-ins, they can bring in so many different colors, so many different themes to everything, especially with every single song having a different horror movie that it's based off of. You can bring in something that's going to more relate to that. But when it comes to like a day to remember, it's a little bit more difficult on that front. However, with, you know, you go back to like, you know, the like late 2009s or 2010s and you always see like the metalcore shirts with like the metalcore monster. I mean, I mean take a look at Attack of the B-Sides. It's really like a TV monster that's on the front of that. They're able to pull off so many other wacky things with potential designs and potential variants off of something like that. So I can see where, especially for a fan like yourself, you wouldn't get tired of more and more variants end up picking up. Yeah, for sure. I, I still always say like, I forget how many songs are on the S10 Kills album. Like, I kind of distance myself from them just because I'm like, I don't want to have expectations for the albums and, and to get sucked back in. Yeah. But I still say it would have been cool to do, like, because I think they're, they might be on like 10 or 12 variants for the new album. So it's like, if there's like, we'll say 14 songs, there is 14 songs. Oh, okay. <laughs> then, <laughs> then like you know just knock out two more variants have 14 but make each variant like themed after the movie or you know the song or lyric later or whatever like have like the colors just harken back to that you know like on the first one like for american nightmare being based off of nightmare on Elm street just do like a half green half red vinyl you know you could have done that but let's do another blood splatter well, yeah, it was, yeah, because like if they could have done that, like I mean, think about it, American Army, they could have done that with. Thank God, this is back to the 2018 one. This is not the new one that we're talking about because yeah. with you go back to the original service game, we know all the elms that are on there, and then it's somewhere you know you with uh so let's go. With thank God it's Friday. You could do something that looks kind of resembling of the hockey mask that Jason wore. You go to it is the end. The variant could basically be the red balloon with a little bit more of like the either a black vinyl or a white vinyl with the balloon image like kind of on there. Yeah, I mean, if you wanted to go in like it that far and you could have just done picture discs for a few of them, you know, or even like, thank God it's Friday, you could have done like, I don't know, clear with like blue smoke made it look like water or, you know, like the river or something Ooh. like that. But, you know, See, this is why you're the one that comes up with the variants. <laughs> I mean, oh, I don't know. It, it's hard sometimes, though. Because you have to like put aside like what you like and what people will actually care about. Because like for me, I love like uh, like the blob with the splatter in it, you know. But like maybe you know someone else doesn't like that. They like halves and like half and halves or you know like a tricolor or something like that. Yeah, because I'm not gonna lie, the splatters are usually a really consistent way to go about it. When it comes to, like, the stuff that I'm thinking about, like, there's some, like, you know, picture discs. I understand that. However, sometimes those picture discs can be really finicky, given the yeah. fact of how precise some of those time, sometimes you have to be on those. Right. And just, you know, there's the whole notion of, like, people saying, oh, you know, they don't sound as good. And, you know, there, there's a little less sound quality. But, it like, unless you're running, like, you know, a $100,000 setup, probably not going to hear it as well as... Like, you know, someone that's just doing it on, like, you know, a $200 player. Oh, absolutely. So, again, it just adds more to it to the point where, I mean, I'm starting to think about more, like, the vinyls that I have. And I'm like, man, maybe I'm, you know, not doing this as well because start, start starting to feel a little bit of the pain here, man. <laughs> I mean, dude, here's the thing. Like, for me, it's like as long as you're doing it to, like, how you want and you're enjoying it, then, you know, I like for me, there is no right or wrong way to collect vinyl. Now, I don't think you should pin the jackets to a wall. But, that is true. That is true. You know, that or you know, like don't touch the grooves or stuff like like hold it from the edge. Aside from that, do whatever you want. Yeah, because like I said with me, it's like every single one I'll end up playing on that thing because I bought it to actually listen to it and play right. it. The only one I'm not is going to be the uh, the disturb when I have that sign because it is a picture disc of the Believe album. So I'm like, no, 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 that one because it's like that one deserves to be 
not just like because I didn't have the I don't because they never made actually like the jack parts like I I just got it I just got it as the disc. So I'm like, you know what? That's gonna be in a frame. Like yeah. that's like that's gonna be protected by glass. <laughs> exactly. So there's uh, there's that on top of it, but also so when it comes to Crestfall, because I know you said right now that you're just really working on pressing vinyl, and what you said earlier is really focusing on those bands that have records out, you know, from the mid 2010s that never really released them via vinyl or really had any physical media around them. When it comes to Crestfallen, where do you see this going in the future from where you are right now? Like, what's the idea? What's the plan? Where do you want to go from here? Um, so I think like right now, obviously we're doing vinyl. I would honestly, I would like to expand into like CDs again or cassettes, you know, stuff like that. Um, because I mean cassettes are coming back to an extent, not as much as vinyl, but you know, like they're they're coming back. But I know I have a lot of friends that just collect CDs. They don't do vinyl. And some of the bands we're pressing, they, you know, can't find the CD from like 2010 of like we'll say like Entity's first EP, right? But like, hey, you know, if you can do a vinyl run of it, maybe ask them to do a CD run, like, you know, down the road um the first band we did until we die he did a cd of i think it's his first ep might be his second i have to i don't remember but he only made 20 copies of it most people are never going to own that cd so you know they're asking like hey maybe hit him up and see like just do like another run of like 100 cds or something like just for the people that you know don't do vinyl but they still want a physical product for that album interesting so because i know with you especially uh, like the physical medium is definitely a lot more of a like that entity that people that people are wanting it seems like that's what you really want to go for so i totally would you know push you towards that because you understand the market in terms of you know that vinyl is gonna be a more prevalent thing you know that uh, cassettes are making their comeback in some sort of capacity and there are still people out there that really kind of just collect cds however you're understanding the levels of you know, the hardcore collector versus the casual collector and where more of those people end up lying both on the hardcore side and the casual side of things. So you could accurately plan that out to, all right, we're going to, we're going to, you know, run this one. We're going to press this one. We're going to make a CD run of this. How many is a good to really good number to really work off of that so that, you know, we're not overextending ourselves, but at the same point, we're not making, you know, so few to the point where, you know, you release them and all of a sudden say you release like another 20 CDs and all of a sudden they get gobbled up right away. And then you have 80 people like, we were going to buy those. Why didn't you make more? And then, but then instead of making 200 and all of a sudden everyone buys one, everyone's happy and you have 80 CDs left over. Yeah. Um, I know like there have been a couple of releases we're looking at doing and cause our run is always 250 copies for vinyl. That's not the minimum that the pressing plant requires, but it's the happy medium where you're making your money back a lot easier and you don't need to charge like $40 for it. But, you know, we're looking at it like, okay, could we do this album as like 300, 400, 500 copies? And we're just, they're like, we'd rather do a first press of 250. If there's a demand for it because of how we place the orders, like we place the order, like within a week, we put pre-orders up. So say, you know, they all sell out within like a day or two and people want more. We could always tell the plant, hey, we'll do a fifth or a sixth variant, maybe like out of 50, out of 100, tack it onto the same order, and it's going to ship the same time as the first press. So now, you know, people are happy. You know, you might have the people that, you know, bought the first press saying, well, gee, the second press color is better. So they might buy that one. But, you know, at the end of the day, you're trying to get that happy medium of like, you're not stuck with like, thousands of copies left over but you're meeting the demand and like the people that want a copy no absolutely you're gonna want to hit that equilibrium point where the supply that you're gonna supply with the amount of you know copies you're gonna make is gonna equal the demand that people are gonna want but of course you know it, it, it's economics this is what i studied in college too because i was in i actually was an econ major so now we're starting to talk a little more of my you know educational language instead of the stuff that i love to do which is stuff like this and talk music but when it comes down to it it's you're going to try and find that equilibrium point because of course it's going to be the most cost effective to do something like that 
However, that's in, you know, this world where everything is known and you have all the information, which, of course, we don't live in a perfect world. We don't live in a perfect economy to the point where we can easily tell this stuff. It's always fluctuating. It's always moving. And there's always many different outside factors that are going to affect supply and demand. So you're going to have to do your best to figure it out. And it's a lot better to kind of try and find that happy medium and play off of that because if you have a like a plant that can do something like that where all of a sudden you can tack onto that order rather quickly and still have things shipped out at the same time, that's a huge, a huge thing because you don't want to end up shipping out, you know, say someone buys, you know, one variant, all of a sudden you run up second one because of the demand and they like the second one, but they get the first one, not the second one. And the second one comes, you know, maybe a, like a week or two weeks later. There was going to be a little bit of animosity there. It's like, but I bought both of them. Why aren't they here? Well, I mean, here's a perfect example. Uh, Structures came back, you know, pressed their new EP. And first press is sold out within like, I think maybe like 20 minutes, if that. And like, okay, we're going to figure this out. We'll do a second run. Second run goes up within a week, maybe two. And, you know, first run, they've already come in. People have already had them. Second run, it's not shipping for four to five months, you know, because they didn't get to have that. They weren't planning for it, essentially. You know, nothing against them at all. But it's one of those things like with the vinyl industry, you kind of have to make like very quick decisions and, you know, just have someone in contact that you can just message and get a reply in like five seconds to be able to pull stuff off where they ship at the same time. Or it's not like that, but it's just something to have a game plan put together to the point where you're ready for you're ready for these different possibilities to happen. Of course, you're not gonna be able to, you know, plan for every single possibility. But when you're in the vinyl space, it's something where or any kind of seller space, what you're gonna need to be able to do is have a plan in place for okay, what happens if we sell really well and we have to create more? Or what's the plan is what if we overextended and people aren't buying it right away? It's you have to have plans for both of those. And then you're able to, when that first, when that first thing happens, like what happened with structures, again, I'm not going to bash them on any way because if they're just coming back and they're just releasing this, who knows how many people are going to buy it? it that could have been just yeah. some sheer dumb luck thing where all of a sudden it, they just sold out within 20 minutes. Right. I mean, they sold out of the second run, but it took a little bit longer, but I mean, they still did it, but I yeah. think they were right in saying like, okay, that's, that's all the vinyl. Or just, I think maybe like, a thousand copies across all the runs so it's like i think they met the demand and they're okay with that but you know they could have just said no second run had a lot of upset people but i think they did the right thing and within their capabilities of how they could have handled it i would say it's, it's somewhere they definitely did the right thing in order to meet that demand at some point later down the line. But I think, again, it's somewhere the plan could have been a little bit better in place for that, like, in case this happens scenario so that yeah. you didn't have that long wait time between press run and press two being shipped out. Yeah, exactly. But for you specifically, this like you're able to learn from this and you're able to work within that uh, the plant that ends up pressing all this stuff to really make sure that, you know, with this sort of volatile vinyl industry, especially where you never know how people are going to end up reacting to these releases, especially if they're releases of previous albums that have been out for, you know, a couple of years, maybe five, six, 10, 15 years, however, they might, how long they might been out. But what you're able to do is you're able to work within that. You're able to move quick on your feet to make sure that when those when all those different variants are able to be shipped out. They're all shipped out at the exact same time so that, you know, like, again, you're not shipping out one variant. All of a sudden, the next one comes out two to three months later and people who didn't get on the first one, but what got on the second one now kind of have a little bit of an animosity and have to wait because maybe one of their collector friends or one of their friends that also really likes the van got their variant, but you're still waiting on yours. Yeah. Um, like for me, I need a schedule. I need a plan. Like that's just, you know, how I am. So. You know, me and a few friends have already figured out how we're packing. Like, you know, one person's going to get the order together. The other one packs it. The other one prints the shipping label. And then that's it. You know, trying to make it as you know streamlined as possible and just not make people wait like any longer than they have to, especially with, you know, plants being backed up and everything. Mm-hmm. 
Because the amount of times I've heard bands uh, talk about how, you know, they have a release date for something and then all of a sudden it gets pushed back because the vinyl pressing won't be done for a certain time. Perfect example, this is, uh, there's a band I'm going to have on the podcast in early October there. That's in their episode release, band called Mirrors. And when we were shooting their episode and we were shooting their podcast, their original release date was October 8th. And the whole entire episode, I kept saying, you know, release October 8th because that was what it was supposed to be. Until I get an email from them right before I'm about to export the video and create the file for it and upload it to YouTube. Hey, man, the uh, we just got word from the vinyl plant that uh, the pressing is going to be late and we're not going to be able to release it until November 19th. I was like, oh, no. I was able to put it like I, on the video. I always have something on the bottom that says, like, you know, the release date. And I put new release date and I put it, everything in the description. So at least like if you're watching a YouTube video on that one, you like it's it's right there for you. You're not gonna miss it. Right. And I'll I'll say this, like a month delay is like the best kind of delay you could possibly have right now. I know a friend of ours is putting out an album and it was supposed to ship, I think, November. Just got an email back saying it's being pushed back to February. <sighs> so it's you know, it's a very messy situation right now. And you know, obviously you're gonna have people that are upset about it you know, in any way, like the bands, you know, understand, but, you know, sometimes the customers that aren't in that like inner circle of like, okay, this is how pressing plants work. They just see, oh, it's delayed. Let's blame everyone involved. Yeah. Have you guys had to deal with any of those problems at all? I mean, one thing that we've seen a lot during the pandemic has been, you know, uh, supply chain issues, shipping delays. We've seen a lot of this stuff happen. Have you guys had to deal with any of this, you know, head on and has this impacted you guys with Crestfallen? Um, not as of right now. Uh, we don't technically have any of our releases in hand yet. We placed our first one and it's scheduled to come in, I think January, like early January, somewhere around there. Um, we were supposed to have the test presses up soon like to you know approve those um haven't heard anything on that but so far it's still within the window of it being on time so hopefully no worst case scenario maybe like a week maybe a two-week delay but it's not going to be something that's like oh hey it's supposed to come out january it's coming out like april like that that definitely won't happen for us at least on the first one yeah because i I think it might have been last year even with make them suffer because i think they had an issue with that as well with their how to survive a funeral album because i remember it was supposed to come out in i think it was supposed to come out in maybe april or or may or something all of a sudden it got pushed back to july but then all of a sudden their vinyl variant started going out middle of june and their whole album release got pushed up to like people started receiving these vinyls on a monday in the middle of june and the release date was july 24th so they quickly had to remove the release date up to that Friday because people are already starting to get their stuff. Yeah, it was, I don't want to say it was a mess, but I mean, it was, it was interesting to watch it. And then like, if you look at some of the variants, I forget which one it is, but like, I don't know if there was one that was out of 150 and one out of 300 or something. And they ended up getting switched, I think, in the pressing plant by accident. So like half of the orders for the one variant they had to cancel or tell them like, hey, you can take, the other one that, you know, you might not have wanted, but we can't go back and repress them right now. But that that release was just kind of all over the place, I would say. It, it really was. And it, again, they're not the only one that have dealt with this. But what this ends up bringing up is just the fact that with with the whole entire COVID-19 pandemic with 2020, with even what's happening still in 2021, there's still a lot of different supply chain issues that are consistently happening. And when it comes to bands releasing music, especially this year, we're seeing more bands release music than ever before due to the fact that during the 2020 pandemic, what were they doing besides sitting at home? What could they do to really, you know, scratch that creative itch that they have as musicians? They could write, they could record. That was pretty much about it. If they weren't going to be doing something else, like, I mean, take a look at uh, Trivium. They released an album in April of 2020. And all of a sudden it's like when they really, and their songs are long. So they actually take a long time on this. And all of a sudden, boom, they're coming out with one in October of 2021. And yeah. there's a lot of bands that are doing something like that where they're having these quick album turnarounds, but it's like, well, what else are you supposed to do in their, during the pandemic? They couldn't, you know, record or they couldn't go out and play live shows. So they could only record. That's where I messed up right there. But when it comes to how many different bands are having so many different things, especially with vinyl being a popular thing, 
there's only a certain number of pressing plants that are able to pull this stuff off. So yeah, and with supply chain issues, with shipping issues, due to the still due to the pandemic and still due to other factors as well, like it's it's something where if you see a album being delayed due to vinyl variant pressing issues and like delays in there. You can't necessarily blame the band. You can't fully blame the pressing. You can't fully blame the people that put it together. There's a lot of different factors at play here that are contributing to this. Yeah, and it's I mean, not just music related. It's also like global economy related. Oh, for sure. I mean, look at like, you know, a pressing plant might be able to do, we'll say like, you know, five to 10,000 copies of an album or, you know, just any vinyl in a week, right? Say they take in orders that equal 20,000 copies. So now, you know, you might spend twice as long trying to meet that demand while more demand is coming in. So, you know, there's a lot going on there. And then, you know, obviously with COVID, you can't necessarily have as many employees in the same space or, you know, maybe some employees had COVID, unfortunately, and, you know, can't come to work or they had to shut the plant down and stuff like that. But I know there was one pressing plant we were looking to do work with. And, you know, we decided, you know, it wasn't the right fit here. We found out through some friends that they just told them that they're not taking any more orders till they meet all the demand of their past orders. So a lot of labels that use them are now kind of screwed and saying, well, you know, we have to put this album out like maybe March of next year and we have to announce pre-orders, but now we can't do the vinyl yet. So it's, it's one of those things that I feel like it just keeps getting worse and worse right now. And it's probably going to stay that way for a bit. Well, it's going to stay that way for a bit, especially with depending upon where you are, especially with these different uh, pr uh, pressing plants. It's yeah, it seems like with COVID, you know, from where we were in 2020 at this time last year, at this time last year versus where we are now, it's, you know, things have definitely gotten a lot better. They're not back to full on normally, but they definitely have gotten a lot better. But then again, it's we're seeing so much more demand for these vinyls to be printed and so many different other variants that these printing these uh print, pressing plants you know there's again there's still only a finite amount of them so the supply of pressing plants has stayed the same but the yeah. demand for you know artists wanting to release vinyls has kept increasing in not just like quantity demand but total demand because you're getting more you're getting more bands that are creating stuff you're getting more bands that want and more variants so the total demand for this is raised over what have been you know two years ago so the demand and how many orders that they have are going to stack up and up and up to the point where you know they're going to end up having to be delayed a little bit more due to the fact that they have to meet their previous obligations will we end up getting back to a point where that can you know those obligate where supply and demand will be equal to each other of course we will that's what happens with economics is an equilibrium point you know, it's like, what is it? What Newton's law of motion, there's going to be a re every action has an equal opposite reaction. Same thing with the invisible hand concept in economics. But the thing is, it's going to take some time here still. And you got to be patient. That's the thing. And, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, you know, why can't you just open up more pressing plants? And it's like, well, the manufacturers that make those machines have a five year wait, <laughs> you yeah, know, like because people are trying to get them. <laughs> So it's like, you know, there's no simple solution right now. It's just, I honestly feel like the best thing right now is just be patient, like, and just wait it out, kind of. No, absolutely. It was even like with the Ice Nine Kill stuff that I brought earlier with, like, the, the merch I bought from all, like, the Nightmare on the Night stuff that I'm still waiting for. It's like, yeah, I'm, I've been waiting, like, three months for this stuff, but I still understand the fact that they're dealing with, like, supply chain issues as well, so... I can't be too mad about it. And when I did email them about it, I'm like, I'm just curious because usually it's a month turnaround time. I'm like, oh yeah, we're still dealing with some of this stuff. I'm like, okay, that's all I, I just wanted to be, I just wanted to know if there was a problem or something like that. But if that's the case, I still understand. Don't get me wrong about that. So I don't see the band in any other light because of it. But it's just somewhere everyone kind of got to understand that this shit is happening. Like these delays are going to continue to happen until the supply can end up meeting the demand. And this is going to be something that's not going to be met for a while. Then this necessarily isn't a bad thing either because you're seeing the growth of vinyl. You're seeing how many more bands are trying to get this to meet the demand of people that want to have the physical medium in their hands or add it to their collection like yourself, Bryce. So it's, it's, it's definitely a good thing, but I hope that with the fact that the demand is continually increasing and supply is slowly trying to catch up to that, especially through what we've had to go through with the pandemic, with um, employment issues because of 
I know there's people, like, I know there's different things going on in the country, especially in the United States with different things with employment right now that other, you know, plants are probably having a problem with, along with a lot of other sectors in the economy. On top of that, different restrictions that were going on in 2020 with, okay, how many people can you have in the same room together? How far apart do they have to be? All these different protocols for COVID. Yeah, it's going to take a while, a long time for supply to catch up to that. I hope that what happens is, is by the time supply is finally able to catch up where demand is, that demand hasn't fallen back. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll see. Hopefully not. I know people are saying like, oh, you know, a lot of people started collecting vinyl when COVID happened. Like they had nothing else to do, realized it was a thing, figured, oh, I'll get into it. And, you know, some people have sold off their collections, but, you know, there's others that are staying in the hobby. So hopefully the people that are staying in aren't discouraged by that. And they're just like, well, you know what? I'm tired of waiting. I need it now. I don't care. Yeah, I, I again, I hope that people are able to deploy some patience and have an understanding around this as well so that, you know, one, again, once supply finally is able to catch up to demand, that demand hasn't just completely fallen off to the point where, you know, we kind of have a crash in the vinyl market because of it. Yeah. I mean, hopefully not. That That's all I can say because then, you know, I would kind of have to switch gears to CDs or, you know, something else pretty quick. Yeah, but again, when it comes to when it comes to anything with economics, when it comes to the internet as well, there's a lot of things that happen. It's like the, the economics of it are very fluid. So it's just somewhere on your end. It's yeah, I know you want to do the vinyl stuff as well, but it's you're gonna have to be able to stay on your toes and pivot if something like that happens. Which right now, again, you are in a good position where the worst case scenario is is what happened to sports cards in the early nineteen late eighties, early nineties, where you know there's a lot of demand for them. And then the supply ramped up so heavily to the point where it exceeded the demand exponentially. And they essentially like, especially for the hobbyists that really, and the huge collectors that really were doing this, you know, because they loved it, but also for the money, those cards end becoming worthless. You don't want to see that happen to vinyl to the point where it might be different due to the fact that how slowly supply is going to have to catch up to demand to the point where if, you know, as demand might end up falling, supply might be able to finally meet that in the middle at some point, and then they might be able to grow together. It's not somewhere, you know, supply is going to try and quickly meet demand and then overshoot it. Right. I can't believe I was going to be able to talk about economics on this podcast at some point, <laughs> but woo! See, you're using your degree then. One of the only times I've been able to use my degree. <laughs> in, in like that actual like full on idea i mean doing the whole entire podcast thing the idea around it yeah i had to use my degree around it for something but for the core of it nah i mean you still have it you have the information and the know-how if you would ever need to use it and i have the piece of paper that says i earned it and as well i'm holding up literally nothing at this moment because that piece of paper isn't in my house right now see i have mine in another room and every time i see it i'm just like you know what i i don't know if it was worth it because, you know, there's thousands and thousands of people in the industry that, you know, or never went to college for it. And honestly, sometimes I question, you know, did I need to go to college for this? But- See, I'm in the same boat as you. And I kind of want to dive a little bit more into this before we, you know, call this podcast, because this is something I'm really interested in. So when you do walk past it, it's what are your thoughts around there specifically? You know, when you think that was this all worth it, do you think that going to college necessarily was worth it? Or are you really thinking that, you know, you might have been able to get through this and really jump into this even earlier than you had been if you didn't go? So I think from at least my industry specifically, right, is it's very much about like who you know. Like you you can know absolutely nothing about the industry because you can learn it. And you can learn it, you know, on the spot and pretty quick. So for me, I, I always look at my diploma as this proves I went to college and paid to meet people that put me where I am today. Like, yeah, I learned the basics of it. I learned the ins and outs. I learned how to do different things. Sure, that, that's valuable in some light. But to me, it's like I got to meet people at college who can help me along if I ever need any help. And that, that's what I view it as. It's like, I don't think I needed to go to get in the industry. I just think I needed to go to have a stable footing within it. If that makes any sense. That does make sense because when you go to college, there's a lot of networking opportunities, not only with, you know, the people that you're going to be in class with, but also the people that are teaching the people that, you know, are going to end up coming in maybe for guests, like maybe just something that you're going to help with the project. Whoever it might be, you're going to end up meeting a lot of people that could potentially get you going in the right direction of, for that degree specifically. 
However, you could be completely different because I, I go past, like, if I think about my degree, I think about my time in college, do I regret it? N- not fully. Not really. And the reason is because, you know, I, I still remember some of the experience I had, especially all the ones that are, you know, not learning related. Like the, some, like the crazy ones, doing stupid shit with my friends, uh, playing Mario Kart, don't drink and drive, where, you know, you start playing Mario Kart, you have to finish your beer before you end the race, but you cannot be driving while you are having your beer. Don't worry. We're not actually driving. We're just playing Mario Kart in the living room, guys. Trust me on this. And it was fun as all hell. And just doing like stuff like that consistently, just it was fantastic. But when it came to the actual learning aspect of it, I mean, I really don't use my economics degree often. I really don't. Even with my full-time job, I'm not really using it at all. But when I think about it, it's even though I didn't get to meet a lot of people that really would have sent me in there, I didn't want to go into any of those industries anyway when I figured out about it. What I want to do is something like this right here. But what that economics degree ended up helping me out was is understanding, you know, kind of like the economics, I think, you know, supply, demand kind of things and just figuring out exactly the supply for me is like my happiness, but like the demand is like, where am I going to find it? Right. And I got to find that equilibrium point to where I'm happy with what I'm doing. However, I'm sustaining myself to the point where, you know, this is definitely going to work out for me in the long run. Right now, it's like, I still got to have that full-time job to make this happen. But again, that happiness part of it is definitely on the bill. So it's like being able to relate different things in life kind of with more of this weird economic mindset. I don't know. It's just the way my, my brain is wired, but it helped out with that. Yeah. I mean, like I, I totally agree. Looking back at college, all of my memories are just like, you know, with friends doing probably stuff that, you know, we probably shouldn't have been doing. We should have been <laughs> studying, but you know, like there used to be a commuter lounge, right? Cause like I commuted to school every day. And so, you know, we would sit around on these really gross couches that were there for probably like 30 some years that, you know, have never been cleaned. And we got the bright idea like, hey, we'll play soccer. Uh, we don't have a ball. We'll use like an empty water bottle. Right. And, you know, we're doing that and we're joking the entire time saying we're really paying, you know, X amount of thousands of dollars a year to kick a water bottle inside the school building. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just one of those things. It's like I, I wouldn't trade that memory for anything and I would do it all again. But like, you know, looking at the diploma, it's like, well, that didn't really help me there. But I don't know. I mean, I think what a lot of it is, is especially when it comes to the way that the education system has been built over the past 30 to 40 years with how prevalent, you know, not only the education, but especially parents as well have pushed college on to people our age, even a little bit older, people that are going through that right now. It's something where you got to realize that's not the only option. Yeah. And for a lot of us, it's we have these different creative ambitions, these different creative ideas that we want to end up exploring and going after. And a lot of times when you go to college, it's sometimes I'm not going to lie, it's those creative ideas and those creative emotions and creative feelings do get squandered in a way. Oh, but for sure. It, the big key is you have to, it's, you, I would say, don't go there with the expectation that, you know, you're going to find that, you know, oh, this is exactly what I'm going to do the first thing you think of. No, 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 no. Because when if you're going to college for most kids, you're 18 at that point. You still don't know who the hell you are. <laughs> Not at all. Like looking back, it's like I was a completely different person first day of college compared to the last day. But like I also I want to say this about college. Like if you really want to get into an industry, specifically like if you're saying like entertainment, right? I interned at a or not intern, I job shadowed technically at you know, a place where they put on concerts at one of our local venues. The one guy there said he went to the same college as me, dropped out second year and ended up there, right? Doing what he wanted to do and saved like, you know, thousands of dollars. The other guy that was there said he would just go to shows. And after the show, he didn't care about seeing the band. He wanted to see the guy that was doing the sound and lights and walked up to him just saying, hey, how do I do this? Like, what do I have to do to get involved? And that's how he ended up there. Never went to college, never went for like, you know, light engineering or anything like that. Just, you know, was like, hey, this looks cool. I want to figure out how to do it, which I think perfectly describes the entertainment industry, because I don't think you can really be taught the specifics of how to do something for it. You just kind of learn what works and what doesn't. Oh, I, I 100% agree with that. Even when it comes to the, from the podcast side as well, it's like I 
had no idea how to get in touch with fans. I had no idea how to do any of this stuff. Like, I started out basically with, literally, with nothing at that point. And now it's just like, I, I've gotten to a point where it's just, I've done so many of these. I've got, I know the style of podcast I run. I know, I figured out how to connect and try and get in touch with different bands, that especially on the Penn side. If they're more on, you know, the established side, if I have to go through PR firm, I have to go through, you know, different managers, I have to go through different people to actually connect with the bands. I figured out how to find those people and figured out how to, you know, construct my emails, construct how I want to say this stuff to make sure that this happens. How do how to work with the different people and how to cultivate those relationships to make sure that, you know, it's beneficial on all different sides so that we can continue to do this. Yeah, it is something I would never have learned, you know, as an economics major in college. Hell, if I went for something that was more specific to, you know, like audio engineering or, you know, public broadcasting and stuff like that, I would not be doing this because it's kind of like somewhere you have a specific style you're being taught and no one taught me the style that I work with. I just... This is just me. This is me being me. And I mean, if you went to school for, you know, audio engineering, you would probably have like the best sounding podcast. It doesn't mean you could get anyone to listen to it or be on it. But and exactly. I'm sure, you know, messaging people, it was a lot of trial and error, you know? Oh, yeah. No one message works for every band. And I, I've learned that the hard way of being left on red multiple times from bands that I know would probably say yes. But they saw, you know, like a seven paragraph outline of everything I wanted to do. And they were just like, I'm not reading that right now. So, you know, condense it, figure it out. But then some bands want the full thing because they don't want to have like, you know, gray areas where they say yes. And then, you know, they're like, well, wait, I actually have like seven questions about it. Mm -hmm. So you got to tailor it to every single one. Yeah, it's and it's that's not something you're gonna learn in college either. It's gonna be like, oh, this is how you write something, this is how you present yourself. It's when it comes to trying to you know connect with these different bands, every band is different because every person is different. Even for myself as well, it's you know, there's some bands you know I get left out red or I get a complete no from, and not gonna lie, there's times where I get a complete no from. I'm just like, well, I'll show you, and it just kind of adds more fuel to fire to kind of figure this stuff out. And that's where I know it's like when it comes to what I'm doing, it's like yeah, it's better than me trying to go after economics because. Even when I get those rejections, it makes me want to work harder to end up, you know, being able to get to a point where I can get those bands on the podcast. They can interview those people that can talk to those people and just have a great time doing it with my style. But it's somewhere it's like if I get that initial rejection, if I was in an economic sense, and I was doing something like that and I got a rejection. I'd probably just be like, oh, darn it. I tried. Give up, whatever. But no, here I'm just like, well, I'll show you. I'm going to get you on at some point, man. And I've had that happen multiple times and I've actually been able to turn that around so far out of like the five times it's happened, been able to turn around once. Well, there you go. I mean, like for me, I wish I was told no on some of these bands. You know, there was one guy that was like, oh yeah, I'll talk to the rest of the band. We'll figure it out. Week goes by, hit him up again, like just saying like, hey, no, you know, no pressure. Just seeing if you were able to talk to the guys about it. If not, you know, let me know. Left me on red never message him back because I don't know where I stand on that. You know, I don't want to be that person that's like, oh, hey, you should really do this with us. But at the same time, like, well, you know, are you, do you want to do it or not? Whereas like I had another band that was like, I'll message our vocalist. We'll let you know. Got back to me, said, nope, doesn't really care to do it. I'm like, okay, that's fine. I at least know. Yep. Got to move on from this one. It's like it's like the best answer you can get is yes. The second best answer you can get is no, because then you know where you stand, which even the ones that have rejected me that said no, because I wasn't big enough. I'm like, well, at least I know where I stand now, where it's like I know the reason why. And I know it's like, OK, now I, I have a, I have a goal that I can try that I can attain. I have a way to go and try and fix it. And when I got told no from one of my favorite bands because I wasn't big enough, literally the first thing I did was I was like, I contact a couple different people. I'm like, OK, I got to redo the marketing on this to get this growth. How can we make this happen? And it started, it started, it started to work. So I know I got to get still bigger, but you know what? Still bigger than it was when I started at that point. So, woo. Yeah. As long as you're working on it, like, I think that's all you can really ask for at that point. No, absolutely. And again, when you said that, you know, with the entertainment industry, it's all about who you know. It really boils down to, even if you are starting out from the absolute ground level, it's how can you work on cultivating these relationships? Because even with you, when you're talking about, you know, those bands end up leaving you on red. Yeah, it's something that it sucks, not going to lie. But 
you learn from it, you understand it, and then you figure out how to go forward from there when you're contacting different bands, different artists, or if any kind of any any person you're within the end of, uh, within the entertainment industry, how to contact them, how to talk to them. Every person's gonna be different. The same the same message and style that's gonna work for let's say one band that like you said wants that full outline is not gonna work for the same a different band that just wants you know the quick bullet points, the three sentences, and then they're going to make a decision off of that. It's completely different. Yeah. And, you know, it's one of those things that you just learn it as you go. And that's really, it. it's one of those things that sucks because, you know, you're unfortunately going to hit those people that you used the wrong format for the wrong person. But you, you don't really know that until after it happens. Mm-hmm. It sucks. But one thing it also kind of does is it kind of weeds out all the all the pretenders in a way, all the people that really aren't passionate about it because you have to learn this while, as you go. You have to learn this on the fly, in a, in, at least at some aspect. There are some things you can learn that, especially in this industry, no matter what part of the entertainment industry you're in, that you can learn before you really jump into it. But for a good amount of, especially the relationship building, you've got to learn that on the fly. Oh, for sure. And I mean, I won't lie. There have been bands that told me no. And I sat there, I'm like, oh, do I really want to keep doing this label? Like, you know, they might have been like one of the top five bands I ever wanted to press. And I'm like, well, OK, my personal reasons for the label might not be there or, you know, entirely. But you know, there's still a lot of bands that other people want to see and I want to make them happy. So got to keep doing it. Yeah. Like, even like I said, when I got rejected, I think it was my second favorite band of all time that rejected me and said, nope. Or it was their it was their PR from me. Like, nope, you're not big enough yet, man. I'm like, not big enough yet. Okay, like let's just keep yeah, going. But it makes maybe, it, but it made me quite. It, it, it said it, it was a no yet. It's like okay, right. so I got the yet in there. But it made me at that point. It made me question. You know, am I doing things right? Am I you know is my style right? Is something like this right? Am I not doing this? You know, because I'm not getting the numbers. What's going on? And all of a sudden, it was like I had to re audit on some certain things about you know the style of the podcast and like everything about it. But then I thought, and I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna try something different. But when it comes to the South podcast, I'm not going to change that. That's one thing that's gotten to me where I am at this point. And if I change it and make it more like, oh, whatever, you know, people are just the casual fans listening. I'm like, nah, nah, not doing that just because that's not my thing. Yeah, and it's totally fair. I mean, I've contacted bands where they're like, hey, we really like this idea. We really want to do it. And we're putting an album out in, you know, four or five months. We don't want anything to interfere with that or, you know, people get confused. So like, Maybe after that, we'll hit you back up and we can, you know, pick up or they're like, after the album's released, hit us back up and we can see what we can do. And it's like, honestly, for me, that's at least like, okay, I know you're, it's not a no. Like for it, you, like, it, hey, it's, it's not a yes. It's a possibility and it might happen. Yeah. And even if say, all of a sudden I'll put it this way, say you have something like that happen where they're not they're releasing a new album in five months and all of a sudden you contact them after that whole entire release cycle really has gotten into full swing and it's like okay you know you guys want to potentially think about doing this even if they end up saying no at that point the thing is is you wait it's like you respected their wishes you wait until that point maybe it's just a no at that moment but you still have that positive relationship with that band and you never know how that's going to reverberate across the industry as well to the point where who knows who they're connected with because all of a sudden if you create a if you have a positive experience with them and a positive relationship with them the next band that they're really well associated with could want to be doing something like that and it's like oh hey this is the perfect match for you boom exactly go with crestfallen baby yeah and all about building relationships within the entertainment industry and something you, you just got to do it on the fly. But you know what? If you really want it and you're really passionate about it, you're going to end up doing it. That's just not for the entertainment industry. Honestly, that's for a lot of places I, I, oh, all over sure. the world. Yeah. It, I, any industry is anything that you're trying to do, especially if you're trying to do it by yourself or, you know, start like, you know, the grassroots style thing. It's going to be difficult, not going to lie. But if you really want to do it, you will learn it. You will make sure it happens and. You'll go through those challenges and come out the other side, a better person for it and better business for it. Yeah. Could and, be both. You know, maybe if you see someone who's going through the same thing that you did, like, you know, 20 years later, be like, hey, quick pointer, this doesn't work. Or maybe try this, you know, because like if you go through those trials and then you just sit back and you watch someone else do it saying like, well, you have to learn it the way I did. Like, I, I don't know. 
feel like you, just be helpful. You know, there's nothing wrong with say, telling someone like, hey, if this isn't working, try this, you know. Yeah, at this point, it's like just deploy some compassion, deploy empathy, deploy some kindness to people that are might be going through something that you've gone through beforehand or going through the same thing you are as you continue to grow because that's just going to be building positive relationships. That's going to end up creating a better industry, a better state, city, country, whoever, wherever you are, better humanity, whatever it might be. Just and it's going to be better for everybody. To, like you don't need to hand them everything on like a silver platter, right? Just like, oh, hey, bands aren't getting back to me or, you know, I'm interviewing for this job. It's not working. It's like, okay, well, condense your message, condense your resume, you know, just something like that, you know, just give them like little tips or pointers or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's condense, you know, the message you're trying to send or maybe put a little bit more in there. That's going to end up inciting something that a like, response from that could be positive. It's like for that, like that interview, uh, maybe condense your resume or if you're actually in that interview process, maybe do something different in the interview than you had been doing. But to, like, if you're just, you know, kind of going through it very similarly every step of the way, like in every interview and you keep getting to know, okay, maybe it's something about the interview process that you're not w- looking at. Instead of just being you no know, super hard line and super, no, you got to learn this on your own. You don't have to hand it to them on a silver player, like you said, but start to just give them suggestions so that they can also think about those suggestions, potentially figure out more about them. It's kind of like that little nudge in the right direction. Yeah, exactly. And you know, you never have to take someone's advice, but I also think so long as the advice isn't in a condescending manner, don't like brush it off. Like as long as you think about it and you contemplate it and decide, hey, I understand that worked for you. I don't think it would work for me. You know, just, you know, take it as it comes, I would say. I'd, I'd say kind of a good way to kind of wrap this all entire up is like, especially with that, when it comes to, you know, taking advice at somewhere Take it with a grain of salt, but don't just like, especially if if someone's giving it to you at a place of, you know, maybe a condescending nature or more of a negative nature. Yeah. Then you might just want to brush up. But if it's from, if it's a place from, you know, potential compassion, kindness, trying to just like give you a little, another idea or maybe push you in the other direction. You don't have to take that advice. You absolutely don't have to do that, but it doesn't hurt. Especially if it comes from one of those places, compassion, kindness, empathy to think about it. Just contemplate it. If you don't want to take it, you don't have to take it. You're a human. You have free will. That's that's perfectly fine. Doesn't hurt to think about it though, especially if you're coming from one of those places, because you might not only you might not take that advice, but it might make you realize something that can end up helping you out in the future. Yeah, one hundred percent. And man, this one from like you know talking about vinyl collections and crazy things to just full on business out of nowhere. But a lot of people need to hear this, man. So. Man, Bryce, I want to thank you for being on the podcast. Today. This was freaking fun as all hell to you know talk about things that I usually don't get to talk about on here. And before we send you on your merry way, I always like to give the guests I have in the podcast a chance to say whatever they want to say, plug wherever they want to plug, promote wherever they want to promote at the end. So, Bryce, floor is yours. Okay, so I would say like buy my vinyl, like don't, <laughs> just go to the store, buy it. Um, no, I'll, you know, go follow Crestfallen Records on Instagram and Facebook. Um, my graphic designer, uh, Nathan Siddle at N Siddle Designs, does great, phenomenal work. If you ever need a logo, he did ours. You know, if you ever need any graphic design, like go do it. He designs houses. So, you know, just give him a follow, tell him hi. He'll probably, you know, be upset because I'm probably missing like 70 messages from him saying, hey, here's all the vinyl variants for this release we can do. <laughs> but, you know, just, just tell him I said hi. Just tell me, said hi. Alrighty, well then, Bryce, I get to end this podcast with three things. First thing is, when it comes to Crestfallen Records, you know, buy some of their vinyl, support them, like them on Facebook, like them on Instagram, and when it comes to his partner, yeah, you know, follow his stuff, send him hi. But instead of having to look up that stuff, because I know you guys, you know, it can get a little bit annoying. And we talk about economics. One thing I know that consumers like is convenience. So take a look at the description of the podcast, YouTube, Spotify, Podcast, iHeartRadio, and Amazon. You're going to see Find Crestfallen Records online. Links, labels, everything you need right there for you. So it's a one-click, one-stop shop. And if you miss out on that, well, ooh, you're going to be disappointed in the long run. So just make sure you go give them a follow, like, say hi, all that good stuff. Bye. Check out some of their vinyl. Maybe give them a purchase here and there. All right, Bryce, here comes number two. So 
Whenever I have guests on the podcast, I always like to make a certain promise to them. This is usually with the bands, though, because it's pretty much I've only ever had bands on there. Where the promise is always, if I like them, I have them on the podcast, which happens every single time. When I need to see them perform live for the first time, or the next time I can see them perform live, if I've already seen them perform live, the promise I make them is first rounds on me. I got to modify this one a little bit because you're not an artist. You're not a band in the band, so you're not going to be performing live, so... If I get to, not an if, when I get a chance to actually, you know, see you in person, meet you in person, maybe, you know, get some of those vinyls and maybe, you know, have to do a quick vinyl swap on something that you got because you might have a cool variant that I like and all of a sudden I might have something you like and be like, okay, let's make a trade. That'll say first round's on me. Fair enough. Had to come up with something like different than what I normally do, but, you know, came up with it on the fly. That's how we do it. So It works. It works. So, Bryce, because I made that promise and I can't wait to keep uh, a tabs on Crestfall and see what happens with you. Ending this podcast with goodbye. Nah, that's too final, man. Want to do this again sometime. Want to keep watching you with Crestfall and see how you guys go and see how many more of these crazy vinyl variants you end up printing. So, it's not goodbye, man. It's see you later. Alright, see you, man. Ooh, well, well, folks, this is my interview with Bryce from Crestfall and Records again. They've got many different vinyl variants they're working on with many different other bands as well. You're going to want to go check it out. So check out all their stuff online. I have links in the description of the podcast below for you for Crestfallen, for all their stuff, for MSOTD Rocks, and for our sponsor, Phoenix Fitness. Once again, so give us a like, share, subscribe to everything, including uh, everything with Crestfallen Records, MSOTD Rocks, the Corporate Girls Podcast. Do it all, baby, because you know what? It helps out a lot. And like I said, this one was a little bit different, but... This is what this is some of the stuff in the music industry you're never going to hear about. I mean, you might hear about it from some other places, but you're hearing about it from two guys that are, you know, past that, you know, ground floor level where we're starting to gain some traction, we're starting to gain some real traction, but we're still nowhere near where we want to be yet. You're seeing this as it happens. You're going to want to keep tabs on myself. You're going to want to keep tabs on the Corporate Crush Podcast and all the bands we have on. You're going to want to keep tabs on Bryce. You're going to want to keep tabs on Crestfall Records. You're going to want to keep tabs on the vinyl industry because there is so much incredible things going on and it can go any which way. You have no idea what might happen. So if if there's a podcast that's super duper insightful for many different reasons than we normally talk about on here, this is the one. So on that note, that's going to be it for me today, guys. Thank you for watching, listening to the Chord Progression Podcast. Brought to MSO City Rocks, Rock Metal Thrive. My name is Kevin, and you guys know how I end every single one. I'm the big, healthy, and hearty. See ya! Yeah!